But, but I am thankful I did not listen to the arguments of one saved, not always saved, when I was an agnostic, because I would have never become a believer. So you either have the Spirit, you belong to Christ, or you don't have the Spirit of Christ, and you don't belong to Christ. Hello, my family. The subject I'm going to be talking about is one of the most controversial issues in all of Christendom. It has to do with the topic of once saved, always saved, or the converse of that is once saved, perhaps unsaved. So I'm going to be discussing that because we've gotten lots of messages, I would say into the thousands now from people who have been in a state of consternation. That is, they've lost the joy of their salvation. And that loss of joy comes from an uncertainty as to their salvation and their going to heaven on the day that they die. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've heard both sides. Maybe you're on one side or the other. But what I bring to you today is from a little bit of a different perspective. Certainly, I'm going to be deep diving into Scripture. So this message is a little bit longer, and I implore you to stay with me so that we can cover what the Bible says, as well as what's elucidated through the experiences in heaven, both from myself and also others that I have interviewed with. You see, I have a unique perspective in that I've interviewed now the most number of people that have been showcased who have had a Christ-honoring afterlife experience. So that means when I talk about heaven, I'm not just talking about my singular experience. I'm talking about the aggregate of all of the experiences of those with whom I've interviewed so that I can assimilate that in terms of this subject's subject and what it means relative to both the experiences in heaven that is validated what will happen in heaven and how you get to heaven, as well as what the Bible says in terms of answering that question. Once you're saved, are you always saved or can you be unsaved? Well, let's begin with heaven. First of all, in heaven, as I think we could all agree, is the fact that there is no sin in heaven. That means that everyone who is in heaven does not sin. Why is that? It is because, my family, once one is released from the flesh, which happens at the point of death, then the spirit takes over. So those of us who have been to heaven and including your loved ones who are in heaven now, they, of course, no longer have a body. There is no warring between the flesh and the spirit, the born again, born a new spirit. So freed of that fleshly battles, the the sin that enters into our fleshly thinking and actions thereof, then goes away in heaven. What's left is the spirit of a person, which in the case of those in heaven is that which has been renewed and revived through the Holy Spirit. That is God Almighty, Jesus Christ. Now, what that tells us is that it is the spirit of a person that lives eternally in heaven and that spirit is kept clean. In other words, that spirit that is released into heaven is without blemish. And so, therefore, everyone who is in heaven is without blemish by virtue, not of themselves, but of the righteousness of Jesus Christ through them. That's why everyone in heaven is sinless. Now, does that same rule apply on earth? No, it doesn't. We'll be talking about the sin nature What happens on earth is that we have two competing 
all attributes of ourselves against the born anew spirit. One of those is, of course, of course, is the flesh. That is temptations that are imposed upon us by fleshly wants, desires. And then, of course, there's the soul, which is the animating part of us. That can be influenced by the world, by what we see, by what we hear, as well as by what the flesh desires. But the spirit that is born anew is sequestered within us. That's kept pristine, unadulterated, pure, made righteous through Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at the two sides of opposing views. One is the side of once saved, sometimes, or at some point, unsaved, perhaps. In other words, there can be somebody who is saved and then lose their salvation. And then the other side is once saved, always saved. Now, I've heard people on, on the side of once saved, not always saved, say that that's a lie from uh, the devil. That's quite severe. Uh, in fact, some people have gone so far as to say that it is the premier lie of uh, Satan. Well, the premier lie of Satan, of course, is not that. The premier lie of Satan denies the deity of Jesus Christ and the salvation message of Jesus Christ. It denies that God, vis-a-vis Jesus and the Holy Spirit, is not God. But that's one of the arguments for once saved, not always saved, being that it allows or permits a person who is born anew to sin, keep on sinning, and it gives license, essentially, for somebody to continue in sin. Well, the other side, once saved, always saved, says that that spirit, as I explained to you, is sequestered within us. It's born anew. It is not at the effect of sin, as is the flesh and the soul, but it is in fact made holy through Christ and preserved unto the point of death and entrance into heaven. Well, I think one of the classic examples in the Bible to start off with is the case of David, King David. Many of you are familiar with the story of David having fallen egregiously. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he schemed to have her husband killed in battle. In other words, he plotted his murder. And then he proceeded to marry Bathsheba. So he was both an adulterer and a murderer. But the consequences are written in Psalm chapter 52, 12, which says this, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So David did not lose his salvation in that Psalm verse. He lost the joy of his salvation And he suffered the consequences of those terrible sins. So let's be clear about this point. That when one commits a sin, there are consequences. The consequences are not erased. But the question is, does the sin that is committed erase out that person's salvation? so that they have to be, in essence, born again, after having been born again. Okay, so when answering the question of once saved, always saved, we have to avoid the legalistic point of view, which is the excessive conformity to the law or a religious code. We'll talk about soon what the law means, in Old Testament times, before the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, versus what it means today in this age of grace. 
So I want to also express, if I may, that we shouldn't be riding the fence. There is one side that is either right or wrong. There's, there's no in between. Either one, either one is saved always or one can lose one's salvation. So we have to call out of the Bible these various verses that are used on both sides of that question. Now, I have heard, as you, as I told you, the theology that has caused a degree of fear on the part of many people has destroyed uh, what they feel is a guarantee of salvation so that they lose hope. Now, the central argument of once saved, always saved, is that the theology gives license for believers to sin and sin again. In other words, if one believes that one is saved always and nothing can impede that salvation, then one can go out and get drunk and go out and do whatever one pleases in the flesh. Well, uh, that might be something that one who is not born anew, not transformed by the renewing of their mind, as Paul said, would think about doing. And indeed, some have gone astray. But the question is, what was the condition of that person once they, like David, had committed an egregious sin, such as in David's case, adultery or murder? Now, the central argument against once saved, not always saved, is that the theology denies the born-again transformation of becoming a new creation for all of eternity. And so that new creation, that born anew experience that Jesus talked to Nicodemus about, who wanted to know how one can enter the kingdom of God, Jesus said, unless you're born again or born anew, you cannot enter the the kingdom of God. He was call, cause, calling out a new creation. But the uh, once saved, not always saved belief says that the spirit apart from Christ is dead, Ephesians 2 1. But once the spirit has come alive through Christ, it beca- can become dead again through sin. So there is a renewal a born in spirit from death in the spirit to life in the spirit to then, according to that, that uh, philosophy or, or theology, one can become dead again to sin. Now let's look at the sixth chapter of Romans, which talks about being dead to sin, quote unquote, but alive in Christ, quote unquote, which begs the question, Can one be made alive again to sin, but dead again to Christ? The proponents of once saved, not always saved, would say, yes. They would say that after one is born again, which Jesus stated as a a requirement to entering the kingdom of God, one can become unborn. And that being born and unborn requires a perpetual state of repentance and that creates kind of a roller coaster ride of repentance, being washed anew, and then sinning and repenting and being born again, again, such that in riding this roller coaster of am I saved, am I not saved, there's really no confidence that at the end of that roller coaster, one will get off into heaven or possibly hell. We're going to be going through a number of verses that will give you confidence on one side of that theology of of once saved or once always saved or once saved, not always saved. So the believers that are one is not always saved state that we can lose our salvation And that happens through backsliding or losing one's faith. They essentially say that only overcomers will be saved. And so those who do not measure up to their definition of an overcomer 
will end up losing their salvation and ending up in hell, even if they've confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. To the once saved, not always saved believers, salvation is conditional, moment by moment. Now, when Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The one side believes that confession and belief equates to eternal salvation, while the other side believes that this declaration and belief is conditional. So the word saved or salvation in the Greek term is soteria and it's used 45 times in the new testament that idea of salvation is to be set apart to be renewed to be essentially born again so the idea of salvation is that the power of God rescues people from the penalty of sin, which is spiritual death. So, of course, there's the physical death, and the spiritual death is indeed in a state of not having a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the once saved, not always saved side would say that one's relationship with Christ is completely divorced, if one sins without repenting. Now, so salvation, by the very definition of that word, delivers the believer from the power of sin. And we can look at uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, where conditional faith can focus on waiting sins that are either big sins or lesser sins. So there is credence within the Bible that not all sins are the same in terms of their effect, but they are the same in terms of provoking one's separation and relationship with Jesus Christ, but not eternally. Okay, let me explain what that means. So the effect of sin is equal in effect to God in that any and every sin will keep one out of heaven unless it's atoned for by Jesus Christ. Jesus indicated that by, by our nature, all sins are equal to God in that they impede our relationship with God. That doesn't mean a divorce of a relationship from God. It just means that there's an impediment. That is, we see we are closer to God when we are in the word, being obedient to the promptings of our heart, born a new heart, to what the truth that is told within the Bible, and that we are steeped in the presence, that is, we're praying and, and dwelling upon God and worshiping the Lord. In his Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus mentioned to us those big sins as murder and adultery and equated them with the unjustified anger that one might have and lustful thoughts in Matthew 5, 21 through 22 and 27 through 28. So anger, murder, lust, and adultery are all sins and we need to take them all seriously. Now, the scripture singles out sexual sin as having worse consequences than other types of sin, because it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Why is that? Because if one is born anew, born again, that is, has a relationship and the Holy Spirit dwells within them to commit adultery, as in the case of David, that person then has basically cohabitated that adulterous, that adulterous desire with 
the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So there's an aberration that takes place. But scripture says that, quote, now, where sin, is incre- where sin increased, grace increased all the more in Romans 5.20. So no one can out God's grace. Just as David could not out God's grace to him in terms of God's calling upon David. And of course, David repented. But he, again, David was talking about the joy of his salvation. He did not have a severance of his relationship with God at that time. So we are all equally sinful before God. So sin, as God sees it, is different in terms of its effect, but not in terms of its relationship, except if one is not born anew, and therefore that sin has an effect of furthering that division of being dead to Christ. But if one is born anew, made alive to Christ, then that sin impedes our relationship, but does not, does not exceed the grace of Jesus Christ. We are, but because in Christ, we are made righteous. We are not made righteous by virtue of ourselves. It is in Christ that we are made righteous. Now, many people have asked me about the unpardonable sin. And and can the unpardonable sin cause one to not only lose their salvation, but to be entirely divorced from the Lord forever and ever? In fact, I've I've received numerous messages from uh, parents, loved ones, who have lost somebody, typically it is a child or a teenage uh, or young adult who has died without evidence that they were practicing the faith. In other words, they were sinning, they were not professing God, but that parent or loved one had said that the loved one who had died had confessed Jesus as as his or her Lord and Savior previously. And was that sufficient enough to carry them through, even though they were like the prodigal son or daughter? And we'll talk about the prodigal son or daughter, what that means in terms of of salvation. And I'm going to get to an important point here, by the way, because I'm going to differentiate what is the walk of, Uh, the walk of faith in Christ versus being saved through Christ. The, the, the difference is salvation versus sanctification. So hold, hold off and bookmark that if you will, as I get to that, because that's really the essence of what we're talking about here. Salvation versus sanctification. Sanctification is the walk in Christ. It's maturing. It's growing in Christ. So, first of all, let's talk about that unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin, quote unquote, is not referenced as such in the Bible. It just doesn't exist. People get the term from Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, where we, where we read, quote, the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven men. So that's where we get the, quote unquote, unpardonable sin, which is, again, not a term used in the Bible. So the question is not, what is the unpardonable sin, but rather, what is blasphemy against the Spirit? Now, if you believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life, then you are saved. And, and it's, no law, it's no longer possible for you to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You're safe and secure in the arms of Jesus Christ. No one can take you out of his hands or his father's hands, as it says in John chapter 10, verses 28 through 29. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, not even yourself. 
And this is stated very clearly in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. So almost no one who commits blasphemy against the Spirit wonders if they have committed that blasphemy. In fact, even the thought of the possibility of committing blasphemy is an indication that one has concern for their position with the Holy Spirit and therefore is not hardened to the point where it is not even a concern or is irrelevant to them. So the one who is then divorced from the Holy Spirit, is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, they don't care about these things anymore. The unbeliever who commits this sin has become so morally and spiritually blind that their heart is hardened to the point that they can no longer care about spiritual things and will never believe in Jesus. I I oftentimes say that having been in the medical field, that it's the patient who denies their illness who is most at risk. Because if the, if the patient goes in wanting treatment because they have, they're feeling pained or, or they feel like there might be something askew and they want to get healthy, then that means that they're not going to be at the full effect of their disease. In other words, they're not going to die. But if, if they go on denying the reality that there's something off with them, the reality of the illness that is in them, then, then they're going to die. Because it is that hardness of heart. And we'll talk about the heart. Because only God sees the heart. And that's very essential to understanding one's salvation and the security of one's salvation. Okay. But, but nevertheless, some people are afraid they have still committed that egregious sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. To them, I would simply say that your worrying about it pretty much proves that you haven't. Okay? And, and in order to make you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were saved, but what sin you committed, you're still being convicted of. And being convicted of it is a good thing. God's grace will cover that sin and all the sins if you will just believe in Christ, Jesus Christ, for eternal sins. And I know the hairs are being raised on the head of those who are of the once saved, not always saved. But again, it has to do with the righteousness of Jesus Christ that imposes salvation versus the righteousness of ourselves, which is, as as, uh, the Bible says, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So our righteousness, which is unrighteous, apart from Christ, cannot esteem righteousness or imprint righteousness upon us. So it's only through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is only through the power of the Holy Spirit through which one is saved. So there are essentially two sins. The Holy Spirit uh, can can be blasphemed about. Uh, And and that is the, the two sins or two categories of sins are resisting the Holy Spirit. And that comes from Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 20. And then blaspheming the Holy Spirit as we've talked about. So we do know from John 16 that the Holy Spirit's job in this world is to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So that's the governing aspect of the Holy Spirit. Now, for the internalized uh, inhabitation of the Holy Spirit from being born anew, when the Holy Spirit indwells us, that conviction comes from within. When one is not born anew, that conviction comes from without. And there are indeed some people that I've counseled who feel that what they're doing is perfectly fine. And and they have no compunction about going about in an illicit relationship or or getting drunk on weekends or something to that effect. They they believe that's entirely permissible. Well, I, I would propose to you 
that those people don't have the Holy Spirit in them convicting them because everyone that I've counseled and there have been many, many people over, over 30 plus years now. So I've been in this a long time and counseling others, both apart from Christ and in Christ. And that is the ones that I counsel who are in Christ, who are born in it, always have that conviction within that, that, oh, you know, I'm trying to overcome this addiction, or I feel compelled to enter into this relationship, or I feel dirty about this relationship, and it's, and I don't want to do it, but I, but I do it, and, uh, and for the addiction, sometimes that's a chemical reaction within them. And, and so there's this consternation within. And for the born-again believer, that's the Holy Spirit that is convicting. But most importantly, we need to understand that only God can judge a person by their heart. So not any person or, or any prophet or anyone can judge you as to what's in your heart. That's solely under the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ. And this came out with the uh, story of, true story of the prophet Samuel. And God told Samuel, don't look at the, at his appearance. He said how tall he is because I have rejected him. He's talking about a rejected uh, individual. Do not see as humans outside appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. That's from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. So the God looks at the heart of a person. The Bible talks about how we can look at the fruits of a believer, that it goes back to the sanctification of the person. That is the maturation of a person in Christ and whether they bear out fruits. We talk about a changed person. A person was very angry, perhaps, very, very hateful, was, was a certain way that obviously was in opposition in their characteristics to, to being a Christian. But, but one who bears out those fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, through 23, reveal the changing effects of the walk in Christ. That is the sanctification Sanctification, the walk in Christ, the maturation of one's self and walking with Christ bears out fruit. And then if one does not mature in Christ, one stays as essentially an infant in Christ. That's why it's extremely important. Now, certainly not to sin if one is secure in one's salvation, but in fact, to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that there is conviction so that one does not sin and that one turns to Christ. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Well, in Galatians 5, 22, 23, they are love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But again, only God knows the heart of a person. So that's what we can see. And we can't read the minds of a person, let, let alone know their heart. Only uh, God can, can, determine, can determine, excuse me, if that person is truly born again. Anyone that puts themselves in a position of determining, for example, in that case of those who have come to me and have said, you know, I, my, my loved one, my son, my daughter, did not live as unto the Lord. In other words, they were, involved in, in a life of sin, are they saved? Anyone who says one way or the other would be a liar. And I've only had one exception where I've answered the question from a mother who has asked if her son, who had not was not living a godly life, was in heaven. Most of the time, in all other cases, I've said this. God loved your son or your daughter more than you do. God wanted to save your son or your daughter more than they wanted to be saved. God wanted to forgive your son or your daughter more than they wanted to be forgiven. 
So I didn't answer the question of whether they're in heaven or hell because I don't understand the circumstance, nor do I have the authority to determine whether one is in heaven or hell. But there was one instance. I'd said that and given that answer to that mother. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And the Holy Spirit said, tell that mother that her son is with me now. I knew it. I knew absolutely that God was saying that to me. I knew it. I, I heard the Lord's voice speaking to me. And therefore I spoke that to the mother. And of course she broke down crying. But that's the only time I've done that because God gave me license to, to speak that to the mother. That's called a word of knowledge. That's when the Holy Spirit speaks forth something which is a truth that is apart from our knowledge, but comes from the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, here's my admonition for anyone who seeks to judge someone, believer or non-believer. And that is, no one knows the effects of abuse on an individual that can lead them to sin, a chemical imbalance that can lead them to depression, a addiction that was started in, in youth that led to this chemical or physiological addiction to alcohol, drugs, or whatever. Even, even sexual sin. No one knows if that effect of mental illness, of bipolar, schizophrenia, or any of those things has led them to their position. I gave a eulogy one time to my nephew. He had schizophrenia. And, and he, he wrote a letter when he, was, when he was phasing into the full effect of schizophrenia. In other words, he was losing himself, who he was, and he was becoming very paranoid and, and really had lost his identity because of the disease. And, and that letter that he wrote before he slid into that uh, full schizophrenic uh, state was something like that. I know I am in Christ Jesus, he wrote. I know that God loves me. I know that I have confessed my sins to God. And he went on in this letter that he wrote so that he could look at it. Every time he, 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 he was caught in the, in the midst of the the horrific effect of schizophrenia, when he lost himself, he could look at this, which is a validation that he had confirmed that he was indeed in Christ, even though he was at the effect of the disease. And he was saying things and doing things that, that we would, might interpret as being someone who didn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But he had accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The bottom line, beloved, is that we can't judge a book by its cover. God looks at the heart. So anyone who judges whether a person is a Christian or a non-Christian is unrightfully assuming the position of God. And that's a dangerous place to be. Only God can see a person's heart. And I detail that in my book, Heaven Stormed. Now, in Heaven Storm begins with my life, uh, starting at an early age. And I didn't know at first why I was writing these things, but then the Lord was orchestrating the writing of this. But he was leading me to the times in heaven, when I was in heaven after dying, when I saw my life in review. And, and, and I was seeing my life as, as somebody as a child who didn't know who God was, I never, I never prayed to receive him. I just, I didn't know. I went to church sometimes and then I didn't go to church 
after my my father was basically expelled from the church and uh and what I realized in my life reviews is Jesus was teaching me through these life reviews, which are common, by the way, in afterlife experiences, is that I was seeing God's redemption throughout my life. Even when I was an agnostic and blaming him, when I had no relationship with Jesus Christ, even when I had an ac- was in an accident, it was on the news. There was one death, one fatality. Well, that was me. Actually, they had to modify that because the car looked like it had been in a trash compactor, you know, one of those compressors at the junkyard. But I was saved for a purpose. And, and you know why I was saved for a purpose? I believe this wholeheartedly based on, and if you read Heaven Stormed, you'll find how, how Jesus, the Lord God, was weaving through my life to the point where I would eventually receive him as my Lord and Savior. I believe it was because I was a truth seeker. That John eight thirty two and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I, I tried to disprove God at, at, at Northwestern University when I was a student there with a team of people. And, and I was adamantly opposed to to not only uh, Christianity, but all religions and, and especially to Christians. You know, I, I, I thought of myself as being kind of more, more of a goody two-shoes than, uh, than the Christians I saw around me. I saw the, as many, as many who were professing Christians who were sleeping with their boyfriend or girlfriend and, and were getting drunk and, 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 and and that I wasn't doing those things. So I thought, well, I was living a more righteous life than them. Why would I want Jesus? You know, and I, and I, and I thought, you know, of, of those Christians who were telling me, as, an, as I was an agnostic, that I, w- I could pray to receive Jesus Christ. And I would say, was that, is that it? Well, they said, well, you have to believe. Confess your sins and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And so, you know, um, you know, and I would say something to the effect of what well, dude, you know, uh, if you're the, if you're the reflection of Jesus Christ, I don't want to be like you. And, and then they, they, and then I would hear from some who would say uh, that, you know, when I would ask them, what happens if I do that, if I pray? And, and one in particular, I remember it was a fraternity brother who said, well, then you have to maintain your position with Jesus Christ. In other words, you have to keep repenting to be washed anew. And as an agnostic, what that was saying to me, and I think many people are thinking this way who are apart from Christ, is I was thinking, well, you know, the the upkeep, the maintenance on being a Christian is too much for me. I, I can't live up to this righteousness, you say, because I have to keep on repenting. And, 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 and recently, not too long ago, there was a situation, I'm a believer, obviously. Uh, I'm born anew through Christ, as, as I hope and trust you are. But recently, I was cut off in traffic and I was pretty angry about that. And I said a cuss word. And I wasn't too holy at that moment. And, and, and that person who cut me off almost caused an accident, which could have again, again, I say almost when I, before when I was in a near fatal accident, could, could have caused a fatal accident. And the question would arise then, if one is a once saved, not always saved, would I, having not confessed my sin, even as a believer, in that moment of anger, that outburst, which eventually I did repent for, would I find myself in hell? And, and the thought of that, even now, is so reprehensible to me because I've interviewed, and some of you have seen my interviews with those who have gone to hell. Those experiences are the most 
awful, gut-wrenching, atrocious experiences one can imagine or not imagine. Because God didn't create hell for humans. Although there is a hell and there are those humans who have died and are in hell, you know, he created it for the fallen angels. Let's look now at the parable of the prodigal son, because I think this will help put things in further context. The parable, parable of the prodigal son, excuse me, is one of scripture's most beautiful stories of redemption and God's grace. And it exemplifies the fact that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. So we're all prodigals and that we have run from God at one point or another in our lives. We've at one point or another perhaps squandered our resources and to some degree wallowed in sin. But God is ready to forgive. God is ready to forgive. Certainly that was my experience in heaven that he was ready to forgive in the moments of my life where I didn't even know him. And eventually I would know from whom I should ask forgiveness. God will save the contrite, not by works, but by his grace. Through faith, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9, and in Romans chapter 9, verse 16, and in Psalm chapter 51, verse 5. That's the core message of the prodigal son. You see, when the prodigal son went off and lived a life of debauchery, was he no longer the son to the father? Well, Again, that's a parable. But when the son came back to the father, and of course he was repentant in that he saw his evil ways, but what he said to the father initially was, can you just give me this humble place to sleep? And, and the father welcomed him, not with, just with open arms, but with a celebration. You see, the prodigal son was always considered as a son to the father, even though the prodigal son had fallen away. Now that parable in and of itself is not necessarily proof one way or the other of the one saved, always saved, or one saved, not always saved. But, but I am thankful I did not listen to the arguments of one saved, not always saved when I was an agnostic because I would have never become a believer. You see, the most attractive part of becoming a believer is that you have security in your salvation. No other religion offers that security. If, if you're of the faith of Islam, you're, you're never assured of a place in heaven. You never really know that you know. And if you're of these other religions, Hindu, you want a state of nirvana or or you believe in reincarnation and you just go over and over. There's no assurance that you finally arrived. But it's the assurance through Christ that is unique to Christianity. And if we remove the assurance through Christ, then what have we? We have a religion of works and not of faith. Beloved, if that were the case, then we would not have a promise, but a hope. It would sound more like a religion of works than of faith. And the problem for each believer who lives in a constant state of repentance or else he or she could face damnation, even if one is saved, is that sin is not just an act of deed. It's triggered 
by an act of thought, an emotion. And I would dare say, there's not a single individual who has not been tempted and actually been more than tempted to a point of even thinking an unseemly thought. God tells us in the Gospel of Matthew that we can sin in our minds, for example, by being angry with someone. It says in Matthew 5, 21 and through 22, that you've heard the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. James chapter 1, verse 14 through 15 says, Give us the principle that sin does not occur until we decide to give in to our internal feelings. That's, what, that's my statement now. But here's the quote from that verse, verses. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it, gets birth, it, gets, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. James chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. So James reveals that sin does not occur when the emotion, the thought, or passion first comes. But if those thoughts are not resisted, then sin occurs when we give into the emotion or the thought or the passion by dwelling on it. And then there's Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 19. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulter adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. So it is the condition of the heart which only God knows. And it's giving birth to that, not just that desire, but to actually doing that which is knowingly evil. Now, I know what, what some who are believe that once saved is not always saved are thinking. Well, uh, they're thinking that if I act upon that sin and I do not ask for redemption or repent of that sin, that I am liable to being of losing my salvation. Well, let's move on because I want to give you an assurance that indeed you can be confident and have the joy of your salvation. Let's, um, let's go back to that accident case. Thank the, the Lord that he knew my heart. Thank the Lord uh, that he knew that this sin is an aberration an exception, my emotion. And yes, I did repent, but I repented because I love my Lord. You see, if repentance comes from just trying to avoid hell and, and not because one doesn't want to offend one's Lord, one's God, the one who loves us most, then one is always going to be like that person who wants, that person knows that they are not loved. They're going to sin and sin again. But once one knows one is loved, is in the one who loves us most. The desire to not sin is from a changing of the heart to please the Lord and not to offend God. Eventually I came around. I asked God's forgiveness. And I forgave the person who cut me off and almost killed me. I have a more egregious one that happened from the uh, rape of one of my dearest loved ones. 
Eventually, I was ready to just strangle that person who had raped my loved one. You can well imagine what I thought. It was an egregious offense. And it took weeks for me to be on my knees and to go through this process of steeping myself in the Lord to come to the point where I could forgive that individual from permanently putting that mark of offense on my loved one. I have had to count the cost of forgiveness. And the only reason that I could do that was because in my heart of hearts, the Holy Spirit reigned over my life and I was not my my own. I was God's. I often speak of that as changing the have to. I have to do something to I want to do it. I have to do it because I know it's the right thing to do to I want to do it because I want to be pleasing as unto the Lord. And that is the mark of the born again spirit. That is through Christ and Christ alone. Now in heaven stormed, I want you to know this, please. When I entered heaven after dying, I I entered in a state of doubt, blaming God because I had lost almost overnight. I had worked 80, sometimes more hours a week, 90, 100, sleepless nights working, trying to earn my way out of my initial uh, time after graduating from from, uh, school and business. And, you know, as I was sleeping in a sleeping bag, and then I had worked up to the point where we were on the front cover of Time Magazine and all the major networks with a possible cure for Alzheimer's and I was a CEO of a biotech company. And, and through a series of events, FDA were calling our, our drug and, and then having to raise $80 million to keep our biotech company afloat. I, I lost virtually everything. And then my, my daughter suffered from strokes and I was paying $1,000 a day to a point where I had nothing more to spend. And then I became ill. And I was sitting sitting in a coffee shop with my wife. And, and she got scared. Because, because I said, I, 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 I don't know if God's with me anymore. She never heard me say that. And I, I was a born again believer. I taught in, 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 in the classes at church. I'd served on boards and Christian ministries and, and churches. I was what people would look at and they'd say, well, that's a good Christian man. But I had just about given up on God. And that's the state of mind that I was in. When I went to the hospital, blood clots, it prevented blood flow to my lungs and an infection caused blood clotting through my body and my heart stopped. And I was dead. And when I cried out the name of Jesus Christ, in my spirit, I was face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said these two words to me. He said, trust me. And he loved me so. Because despite myself, despite giving up on him, he had never given up on me. God redeemed all of the experiences in my life as he will redeem all of yours. But we must surrender to him. 
You see, in heaven no one desires to sin. No one has any thoughts that are unclean. Why? Because the flesh has been destroyed. And the born anew spirit has been freed in heaven. Free of, freed by the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. The undefiled nature of people in heaven proves that the born anew spirit or person is destined for heaven. And the perverted flesh and the brain of a born anew person cannot determine the born again person's eternal future. So let's settle the issue of salvation once and for all. Quote, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this comes from 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Now, are you trusting Christ to save you instead of depending on your own good works? Then you're saved. Jesus said this, he who believes in me has everlasting life. John 6, 47. Now, doubts always rise when you go by your feelings instead of the Bible. Your feelings are like the weather, they change. But the word of God never changes. And when people deny the security of their salvation, they are oftentimes confusing salvation from sanctification. Our salvation is a one-time event. Our sanctification, on the other hand, is a moment-by-moment -moment process that does not end until we leave this earth. From the moment we receive God's gift of salvation, he begins to work in us through the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. Paul writes this, I know the one in whom I trust, and I'm sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. In 2 Timothy 1.12, many have said this, I thank God for his saving and keeping power. Like me, you are not keeping your salvation. Your Savior, Savior, Jesus Christ, is keeping you. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, all things have become new. So confidence in one's salvation is not a license to sin. Rather, it's an understanding that we cannot earn our salvation on our own merit. And therefore, nothing we can do will cause us to lose our salvation. God has purchased us, sealed us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to now deep dive and please bear with me as we go through this. This is so important. Because if we're not secure in the knowledge of what God says about our salvation or our lack thereof, then we are going to struggle all the days of our life. And we may end up doubting God. So let's do a deep dive into Romans chapters 7 through 8. Paul was speaking to the Romans. He was attempting to give them a solid foundation of both salvation and the difference between the law and, and the, the, what the law provides versus what the salvation of Jesus Christ provides so that that message of salvation, of the great news, good news of Jesus Christ would spread throughout of all of Europe. Let's begin with chapter seven now. 
which says this, as Paul writes, Do you know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, and I'm emphasizing those um, verses or parts of those verses that I'm calling out, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. So that law then is a governing rule by which the person lives, but the law is in effect until the person dies. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So death is the end all, be all. That is the point in which the spirit is released. These are my words, of course. Let's go on to chapter four. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ. Now he's talking about salvation. So the law convicted us. Thou shalt not you know, commit these sins. But through the body of Christ, we died to the law. That is, Jesus Christ had fulfilled the law. Doesn't mean that we don't practice that which is expressed in the law. It means that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law in terms of our salvation. Let's go on. That you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Belonging, that belonging is constant through Paul's writings. In order that we might bear fruit for God. That's the sanctification part, bearing out fruit. And here I emboldened this. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we, were, we bore fruit for death. In other words, the law was not our salvation. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So what's the new way? It's Jesus who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And verse seven, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. So the law did define what is sin. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law has, had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, pronounced in me every kind of coveting. In other words, it revealed that which was innate within the flesh. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Now I emphasize verse nine. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Obviously, Paul didn't physically die. He died to sin through Christ. And verse 10, found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. So the law condemned, but the Spirit of Christ brought life. Verse 11, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? In other words, did that which is good cause me to, to die, not physically he's talking about, become death to me. In other words, a condemned, back to condemning. And he says, Paul says, by no means, nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it is used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandments, sin might become utterly sinful. So we are dead to sin, through Christ. Verse 14, 
we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin, talking about the flesh now. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate to I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do good, the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So Paul is talking about the sinful nature that is of the flesh. And he said, the sinful nature causes me to do it. You heard that joke, I think it was, uh, who was it? Um, you'll know there, I can't remember his name now. He said, uh, the devil made me do it. Sin made me do it. The sinful nature causes us to sin. So, but, but Paul was born anew through Christ. He's talking now about his, his struggle with sin because of that sinful nature. But the law condemned him because of that. But the spirit of Jesus Christ gave him life, spiritual life. Verse 21, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. That's the sinful nature. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. That's sanctification, not salvation, sanctification. What a wretched man I am, Paul says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Again, as flesh. Verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, I'm a, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So, pause for a moment. If we are slave to our sinful nature, and we can repent of that sinful nature and should repent of the sins that we commit, Paul is talking about another life that he has, which is apart from the sinful nature, which is the one that gives righteousness in place of unrighteousness. Again, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Let's go on to verse eight. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. He's acknowledging the sinful nature, which is resident within him and each of us. However, the spirit gives life and has set you free from the law of sin. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, an atonement if you will, and so he condemns sin in the flesh. And listen to this, in verse four, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, fully met in us, fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we live according to the spirit. If we lived according to the flesh and our sinful nature, we would need to abide by the consequences of our sinful nature. We can be at the effect of that sinful nature. We can have uh, the consequences of that sinful nature borne out. And we should not walk the walk of Christ to mature so that we change the have to to the want to and that we prevent ourselves from sinning and if we sin, we repent. However, verse five, those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on what the flesh desire, 
but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. So what is repentance of sin? That is repentance for what this flesh desires. Repenting for what my flesh desires. Repenting for what I desire in my flesh. Verse 6, the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Should we live in the spirit or should we live at the consequences of our flesh, sinful nature? The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Cannot please God. Verse 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. In other words, when you're born again. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So you either have the Spirit, you belong to Christ, or you don't have the Spirit of Christ, and you don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin... The Spirit gives life because of righteousness, not our righteousness, my words, but of the righteousness of Jesus Christ who courses through us. And, and verse 11, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Verse 12, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh but it is not to the flesh, to the living, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. So being more spiritually minded than fleshly minded, that's sanctification, the walk of Christ, the maturation of Christ. Do not willfully sin, but through the purification and the repentance and the redeeming nature of Jesus Christ, we are sanctified. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. There's fear again. Many have fear. Rather, because the, the doubting of one's salvation, and I go on, rather the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. We are children of the living God. Verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. What is an heir? An heir is one destined, destined to inherit the kingdom of God in heaven. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. Verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will, will be revealed in us. He's speaking of the inevitable. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And that happens, beloved of the Lord, in heaven. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been in groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is, that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it 
patiently, and that would be heaven, our reward. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Again, that's, that's the Spirit who prompts us to, to ask for forgiveness and to run away from sin. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That is our Spirit, born anew through Christ's Spirit, where the Holy Spirit abides with our Spirit and constantly intercede, enter, intercedes for God's, for us in accordance with His will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that sanctification, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, excuse me, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither a height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. <laughs> now we've finished hearing the word of God which speaks freedom, truth, and salvation, and the security of our salvation, not of ourselves, but of Jesus Christ. Paul spoke to the Roman Christian church about the essence of salvation. And in the New Testament, the law refers back to the old situation when people looked at obedience to the commandments as the way of acceptance with God. And there are those I would propose who are fearful of their losing their salvation, who are still adhering to the commandments. as justification for entering heaven. Remember the story of Jesus Christ talking to the rich young ruler? This comes from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22, when the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what good shall I do that I may have eternal life? So the rich young ruler stated that, Jesus, uh, stated that Jesus, to Jesus, that he had kept all of the Ten Commandments all of his life, which of course he had not. I mean, no one does. Uh, thinking that he, the rich young ruler, was justified by his own goodness to go to heaven. But Jesus called out the rich young ruler's hypocrisy. He said, no one is good but God. 
And then Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. Well, of course, the rich young ruler was owned by his riches and being unwilling to leave his wealth, he went sorrowfully away. So the key to eternal life is following Jesus. In and of itself, the law, one is condemned by the law because each of us breaks the law. Each of us has sinned. Each of us has a sinful nature. But it is by following after Christ that one then is changing the have to. That is, I know I have to abide by the law, to the one to, that is the transforming of what Paul called the renewing of the mind, that is the walk in Christ, and that's the process of sanctification, not of salvation. Romans chapter 7 and 8 teach us about justification through Christ alone, and not not because of our good deeds, just because of our good deeds, or lack thereof. In Romans 7, 1 through 4, it says the old law is no longer binding. And that Romans 7, 5, 6, this freedom from the old law is good. And that is a freedom from fear. The fear of rejection, the fear of being rejected by God. If one is born anew, having confessed one's sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us once of one's sins. No fear of corruption, for we are redeemed from physical death, as it says in verses 19 through 25 of Hebrews 9, 15, 1 Corinthians and 9, 15 of Hebrews, 1 Corinthians 15, 53. So the, the simple point in Romans 7, 8 that we read through is that if you live under grace, sin will not have dominion over you. But if you live as though you're under the law, sin will have dominion over you, as it says in Romans 7, 9. So you'll be in constant fear that if you sin and you die, you're going to hell. And that's not a fear that God wants you to have. He wants you to have be freed, be freed, not of your sin, but to be freed, to be confident in your salvation so that you can grow in maturity toward Christ. It doesn't mean that we're free from the dominion of our sin nature that still exists but you can lay aside your sinful habits and attitudes and be progressively conformed into the image of Christ, which is the walk of sanctification. That is the walk of Christ. And that takes personal discipline, being steeped in the word of God, worship, prayer, in constant conversation with the Lord. And being saved is not the same thing as being mature in Christ. But our goal is to be made mature in Christ through all of these things that I just mentioned. Because apart from Christ, we are altogether unrighteous. Though we may appear good by our own standards, the Bible says there is none that doeth good, not one. Romans 3, 10 through 12, not one. Such truth is offensive to the pride of self-righteousness, the self-righteousness of humankind that wants to establish human-made laws over God-made laws. God gives grace only to the humble, but he resists the proud, as it says in James 4, 6. And oftentimes, and I have to say this, you know, when a person really receives adulation or they, they believe that they found the answer and they can speak definitively and and, and say that, you know, that the, the worst sin that, that the devil has ever 
given or the worst lie is that once saved, always saved or, or that, you know, we're, we're stupid in uh, believing that our, our salvation is secure. Uh, all of those things are, are not spoken from a humble heart. I, I, I would propose to you, they're not spoken from a humble heart, but one as an authority, one from authority that rightfully belongs to God. Almost every time the word sin is used by Paul in the verses we just read, you could substitute the sin nature with no change in meaning and looking at the Greek translation. So the subject of Romans 7 and 8 is about our sin nature having been overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ. For sin, that is the sin nature, shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace, as it says in Romans six fourteen. So prior to salvation, we are under the law, as it says in Galatians three twenty three. We're controlled by the sin nature, and we're dead in trespasses and sin, as it says in Ephesians two one. When we get saved, we become dead to the law by the body of Christ are being crucified in him, Galatians 2, 19 through 20 and Romans 7, 4. And as such, we are no longer under the law, Romans 7, 6, Galatians 3, 24 through 25, having been delivered from the law, Romans 7, 6, we are now under grace. And under grace, sin has no dominion. Doesn't mean that we don't sin. It just means that dominion of that sin is now no longer our personhood. Our personhood is defined by our born anew spirit, who is the one who resides eternally in heaven. And therefore we serve in the newness of life. Romans 6, 4, 7, 6. And Romans 6, 11 says, we are now alive unto God. Galatians 5.1 says we are to stand fast in the liberty within Christ who has made us free and not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. This means we are to stand fast in the grace of God which we do by faith and the, cro- the cross alone and the cross alone and not live as though we're under the law because grace makes us free, Romans 8, 6, 14. The law keeps us bound, Romans 7, 9. The cross being crucified with Christ and made free from sin, Galatians 2, 20 and Romans 6, 7, is the liberty that makes us free in Christ. And if we don't take it up daily, we cannot live in the freedom it provides. So that's the process of sanctification, not the license to sin, but the abiding in Christ, in the word of God. Beloved, when a born-again Christian lives as though he's not under the law, meaning he lives by the oldness of the letter and not the newness of the spirit that is spoken of in Galatians 3.23 and Romans 7.6, he will live as though he's under the dominion of the sin nature, Romans 7.9, simply because the experience of freedom we have and that we must walk by faith in the finished work of the cross, Romans 6, 11. And for us to lose our salvation means that God would have to unregenerate us, that we would be unborn and would need to be born again, that God would need to crush the spirit that lives within us, he would need to destroy the born again spirit that lives within us. And then he would have to resurrect that spirit again. In other words, to lose our salvation means that God would have to destroy the human spirit that he once lifted up. And he would have to turn off the spiritual light that was once turned on. The Apostle John speaks of false believers. And it's important now to understand that there are false believers. 
he says in 1 John 2.19, They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. So they were never of them, those who left. And then there's the parable of the sower, sometimes called the parable of the soils, is the parable of Jesus found in Matthew 13, 1 through 23, and Mark 4, 1 through 20, and Luke 8, 4, 15. The parable of the soils talks about being rooted in the word of God in truth and growing in God's truth. That's the sanctification process. And the person grounded in truth lives. The person who depart, departs from truth strives. And when I was in heaven, as I wrote about, there was a time when Jesus actually placed the book of life in my hands. In my spiritual hands in heaven were somewhat translucent and I could see the Holy Spirit imputing or imparting his hands through my hands such that I could hold the word of God. And that was the sanctification not but the born anew part of me that had been sanctified by Christ such that the word of God was felt by me as the loving presence of God. And we know from 1 John, it says this, in the beginning, one, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, so that those who are grounded in truth, God's word and his presence, which I felt, his word, his word signifies his presence, and became his presence, Jesus upon the earth, to surrender to the God of Jesus Christ, these ones thrive, and those who depart from God's truth and deny his truth wither away. That would be that one who had denied the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that a Christian commit, can commit apostasy. I believe the one who falls away from Christ was never a Christian in the first place. I know that is mocked by some. But again, God knows the heart of a person. And I know those who've been born anew in my life, and there have been thousands of them. And those who were sincerely born anew, though they may fall away, always were pulled back and their heartstrings were pulled by, by God. They were not apostates. Remember what Jesus said. He said, He that stands firm to the end will be saved, Matthew 24, 10 through 13. And that the only power by which we can stand firm is by virtue of the power of the Holy Spirit, who is strong in our weakness, who gives us that strength to persevere and to the end, so that we can say, as Paul said, I fought the good fight. Now let's return to the passage in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, that we examined earlier. In my opinion, these people who fell away were never Christians in the first place. For in the case of those who had been enlightened and had tasted the heavenly gift, had, have not been partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify themselves to the Son of God and put him to open shame. That is used oftentimes by those who are of the once saved, not always saved. But bear in mind what this is saying impossible to renew them again to repentance. Some term that as a reprobate state, but if one is renewed to repentance, that means that they have been not, that they, their renewal through Christ 
has been negated. And on the surface, the passage seems to describe people who have a powerful, powerful experience with Jesus Christ, but then committed apostasy and will fell away from Christ. However, upon further review, that's not the case at all. Jesus said to them, I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will also give for the life of the world. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. From this time, many of the disciples turned back and no longer followed him, as it says in John 6, 51 through 66. Of course, Jesus is using metaphors when he's speaking, when he preached about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's referring to the cross and simultaneously to full commitment, to salvation and sanctification. If only we taste something, we can always spit it out if we choose. However, if we partake of Christ's renewing presence, that is the Holy Spirit, it becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of us. Take a hard look at your own faith right now. Take a hard look at your own faith. It's clear that The apostates are people who make professions of faith in Jesus Christ, but never genuinely received him as Lord and Savior. They never partook of the Holy Spirit. And these pretend believers never truly surrendered to him. And if you have any doubt, then uh, surrender yourselves right now. Ask forgiveness right now. Repent of whatever it is, any offenses against anyone else, and, 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 and ask the Lord to forgive you and take possession of you, to search your heart. So now engage in this thought. The passage is warning against apostasy, and I know this is a fear of some. Exhort everyone to be sure of their salvation. Our eternal destiny is not a trifling matter. We are to examine ourselves in order to be certain that we are in the faith and not just giving lip service to it. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not realize that Jesus... Do not... do, Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, as it says, we fail the test, as it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. What is the test? The test, beloved, is if you have sincerely confessed your sins and believe in him, Jesus Christ, and have surrendered to him and invited him into your heart, Fight the good fight, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Gentleness, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 17. Now I'm going to leave you with a number of verses that you will see on your screen that testify that Jesus will never leave you, that you can be confident in your salvation, that you can have a healthy conviction that when you sin and that sinful nature gains a victory, that you can go to the cross and ask for forgiveness. But the reason you go to ask for forgiveness 
is because you want to. Because the one who loves you most, you do not want to disappoint or offend. God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in, in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. John 3.16 That's you, isn't it? That's you, beloved. It's time to be at peace. It's time to walk confidently so that we don't keep living as children, but as one mature enough to be conformed to the image of Christ, to believe, but also to be humble of spirit, and to know that the walk in Christ is not easy in this world, but that we have the power of the Holy Spirit who abides in us to overcome all evil, all temptation. For the will of humankind that is in Christ, you and I, should be one to want to please God in all things. And if today you're living in an unhealthy relationship or, or you are struggling with an addiction, or you're watching something that you should not watch. And, and there's a constant pulling of you into a place of darkness. Don't give up. Don't give up. If you fall down, get back up. If you fall down, get back up. Even if it's a hundred times, you get back up because you need to remember to whom you belong. You cannot give up. You must persevere to the end because heaven, beloved of Jesus Christ, is in your future. And be of good cheer. Take care. And God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.